Those of you that are way back in the back, come on up a little bit because this could be it could be a little interactive. It's going to be a little bit like this morning. I mean, I, I was watching the BQA demonstra or the BQA certification. I said, "Well, shoot!" I said, "We need to have that for genetics. We need to have some competency for genetics, just like." Our industry needs competency for process, right, Rob? Makes good sense. So I quickly, in the last couple of hours, developed the Genetic Quality Assurance Program. And you'll all be certified if you pass the test. It's not the hardest test ever, but hopefully there's some pieces in it we can learn from a little bit. Which of the following is a true story? And I don't have that thing where the, little, where the circle comes up at the end. I have to build that in later. Which of the following is a true statement? A, if I buy good bulls, I will be profitable. B, if I buy good bulls, and I, get, I will get paid more money for my calves. C, if I buy good bulls, my neighbors will respect me more. And D, any or none of the above may be true. Any or none. How many people think it's E? E, good with E? Because it's, it's true. Any or none of the above, see, I'm not that sure about, but if I buy good bulls, I could be more profitable, depending on how I define good. And if I buy good bulls, I could get paid more money for my calves, but I'm going to have to go through one of the value-added programs to get it. It doesn't mean I deserve to get more money for my calves. If I don't do anything I've never done, I won't get any more money for my calves than I got last year. Okay, how long will the g genetics or the bulls I purchased this year significantly affect my business. If I buy bulls, bought bulls here this spring, or I go out and buy some private treaty bulls right now, how long will they significantly affect my business? Two years, five years, 10 years, or 15 to 20 years? That's a good question. I'm going to say yes. How, what percentage of producers retain their own females? 85, 90-ish. So we'll go with that. That's a good question. That's good. That'll be, come, come up a little bit later too. Two years, five years, 10 years, 15 to 20 years. Anybody that was here last year, saw the presentation last year, is absolutely 15 to 20 years. Buy bulls in 18, breed cows in 18, calves born in 19, breed the first dog, or have the first calves, breed the first cows in 20. First cow's calf in 21, I'm already down the road, three, four, five years. If those bulls last five or six years like they should, they're still breeding cows, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 2022 and 2023. So in the year 2033, my 10-year-old cows, the cows that have earned a living, made money for me, the 10-year-old cows are probably sired or could very well be sired by the bulls I bought this year. It's actually, that's a good thing for the, tr for, the, for the folks here at Trinity. you got to turn your bulls over more often. More often. <laughs> but still, even if you keep them two years, you're 2031, you're 10-year-old cows. And if they last longer like that, would the Trinity genetics last longer than 10 years as cows, we might be in 2035 or 7, you still got daughters of this year's bulls. Huge long-term impacts of the bulls that you pick and the genetics that you pick. Next question is about heterosis. Heterosis is the single most valuable tool in the commercial beef business for the promotion of profit. Single most valuable tool. B, heterosis adds more value and profit to my cow herd than it does to my calves. It's a little different. C, I can't fix poor, I'm sorry, heterosis cannot fix poor genetic selection decisions for breeds and individuals. And D, it is absolutely proven to add an additional $100 to $200 per cow per year of profit to commercial cow-calf business in this nation, by, mainly because crossbred cows last somewhere between a year and a year and a half longer than straight-bred cows. I read, this, this one's not proofread well enough because the answer is E, all the above. Absolutely all the above. The first one, guarantee if there was a shot, that we could add 100 or $200 of profit to every one of our cows, we would run those cows through the chute many, many times. But there's no shot that'll do that. 
This one's an interesting one. Adds more value and profit to my cow herd than it does to my calves. And that's because the real value in heterosis is in the crossbred cow. Even though crossbred calves perform more, grow faster than purebred calves do. But the value is in this one to one and a half, or year to year and a half of extra production. In her. And <laughs> heterosis does not fix bad decisions. Guernsey longhorn cows do not add value to your production. But they are fully and completely crossbred. And they probably will get bred more years than you wish they did because they're fully and completely crossbred. Next one. Whoa, this was a, something happened in the translation between computers. Actual birth weights, A, are the best way to select bulls to help ensure that I don't have calving problems when I take them home. B, they're much more valuable than adjusted birth weights because they're actual. C, are relatively consistent by sire regardless of the size of my cows and the body condition of my cows. D, are very similar regardless of calving season and region of the country. Birth weight's similar if you're in Florida or if you're in Washington. And E, are an inferior risk management tool when compared to using birth weight EPD. A little tougher one. A's, B's, C's, D's, E's. Guys are gonna, you guys are going to pass this. You're going to get your certification today. Abs, abs, all these top things are things that you hear all over the place. But ultimately, if you want a, the most risk management for birth weight and cabin ease, birth weight EPD, cabin ease EPD, and the rest of it is not important. Not important. I promise if you live in Florida and you, and, that, and you calve in the fall, your heaviest calf will be 86 pounds. And if you live in Calgary, your lightest calf will be 94 pounds. And yet the genetics could be, could be sired by the same bull. So keep track. Keep track of the birth weight EPD and the cavities EPD. Those are what matters. I may change that slide to cavities eventually. Which of the following is true? 65% of the variation in weaning weight is explained by environment. B. Maternal heterosis in a completely crossbred cow has three times the positive impact on enterprise profitability than it does in an F1 Simangus black baldy kind of calf. Three times more value in the cow. C, income per head is a much simpler number to calculate than the cost of production per head. D, milk EPD is actually not milk. E, terminal sires can actually be a great driver of profit, even though some of us use the word terminally negatively. And E, all of the above are true. Anyone in there, you, any of those that you don't like? Any of those that don't make sense? Because they're all true. They're all true. This one's a good, good uh, over dinner discussion. How milk EPD is it milk? Milk EPD is maternal weaning weight that they couldn't explain with growth. The difference in weaning weight of a bull's daughter's calves that they couldn't explain with growth genetics. So then everybody sat down and said, what do you want to call it? It's called milk. It's not milk. Some of it's milk. Some of it's maternal environment. Just an interesting fact about the genetics business is milk is not milk. Milk is pounds of calves due to maternal environment. We just call it milk. This is a big deal. When we're making genetic decisions, it is easy to, it is easy to think about output traits. I got paid this much. And it's really difficult to think about cost traits long term. Because when we purchase a bull, the implications of cost are not always very straightforward. And 65% of the variation in weaning weights explained by environment is why sometimes high weaning weight bulls have low weaning weight EPDs because their environment was better than the other ones. So EPDs are highly accurate, technical, and calculated using science, mathematics, and mathematics, and can be very difficult to understand. <laughs> I know a couple of them say, yeah, yeah, that's true. I like that. B, EPDs help remove the environmental influences on the traits that are measured. 
C, EPDs are far superior to actual weights and measures to predict progress, which I gave that away. That's true. And D, EPDs are like asking everyone who has ever used the genetics how they perform for them. That's my favorite thing about EPDs because they are they're conf- the science and statistics in EPDs are mind by when they start taking DNA and incorporating them into EPDs based on individual SNPs of 50,000 genes, you start going, whoa, I'm out. You guys do that, I'm out. But the data that's collected that goes into EPDs is all that, it's like asking you, use the same two bulls that you used, how'd they do? Well, bull A beat be bull B. You say, well, bull A bull, beat bull B. You say, bull A bull beat, beat bull B. You're like, not in my house. Bull beat bull, bull B bull, beat bull A. <laughs> easy, for me to, uh, easy for me to say. But my point is that the computer says, well, everywhere but there, bull A bull, beat bull B. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with bull A. Even though sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. That's one of my favorite things about EPDs, how simple, how simple that is. Source of seed stock, which originally was going to be a big part of my presentation before we changed it all. Source of seed stock may have an effect on the value of your feeder cattle. A little bit like the first question, but not quite. Source of seed stock may determine the may determine the warranty program offered in the case of unforeseen circumstances. Source of seed stock will absolutely determine your genetic direction and improvement over time. D, source of seed stock is the most important de- genetic decision you'll likely make. And E, all of the above. Anybody say A? B? C? How about D? Obviously, the answer is all of the above. Moving forward, A is going to be a bigger deal every year. Ten years ago, A didn't matter. Nobody asked. Now they all ask. What genetics are you using? What genetics are you using? Chip gave a whole program about that. And your source is going to be crucial of it because on C and a little bit of D, Whatever your seed stock producer is doing today, and if you come back here and continue to buy bulls, you're going to do exactly the same thing genetically that they do. Wherever they're headed, you're headed too. If their cows are getting bigger, yours will get bigger. If their calves are getting smaller at birth, your calves will be getting smaller at birth. If their cattle are getting more marbling, ultimately your cattle will get more marbling. There's a delay because the, the, the females that, are being, that were born this spring won't be their donor cows for four or five years. So the front end bulls five, six, seven years from now, they made the genetic decision for last year. There's a delay, but wherever they're headed, you are too. So you better choose wisely. Cow-calf producers should not pay attention to carcass genetics because, A, most of them sell their calves at weaning. Doesn't matter. B, high carcass value cows do not make good females. High marbling cows, they just don't laugh. C, in the future, marbling will have a much lower impact on the value of beef. D, my seed stock provider said I should ignore carcass data. And E, we don't eat the cattle in America. Better go with F. Better go with F because... A, even though you sell your calves at weaning, if you believe, like I believe, that there will be more information about your calves year in and year out, moving forward, farther down chain, then you might not be the one that five years from now they say, you know, don't buy those calves. They don't marble worth a dang. You might not want to be those folks. B, I hear all the time. And I just laugh about it. Well, those high carcass cows, they don't make good cows. Why don't you buy a few Shear Force daughters? Some of the highest carcass value calves in the whole Semitol deal. And probably the highest stability proven bull that there is. Those traits are not antagonistic. They may be antagonistic in certain lines from certain breeders that didn't pay attention to both and didn't use their indexes the way they should have. 
but those are not antagonistic traits. You can absolutely make progress in females and progress in cargo traits both. Marbling is going to drive our business, in my opinion. The one thing we can do in the United States that they cannot do in the rest of the world is put energy into cattle and sell a highly marbled product. Nowhere else in the world do they do that. Maybe Argentina may be moving in that direction. We're the only country that can do it. So we have to compete with ultra-low costs of production in third, second and third world countries. But the way we can do it is we produce a product that people like to eat more. So I, don't, I see no reason in the world why the impact of marbling will be any bit reduced. If your seed stock producer says to ignore them, I'll, have, I'll address that in a little bit. And obviously, if they don't eat the cattle in America, there's no reason to have educational programs because we're all going to end up doing something else anyway. Dollars API, dollars TI, dollars beef, dollar weaning, dollar herd builder, dollars profit. All these indexes that, we've, that you know, have blown up here in the last 6, 8, 10 years, uh, what about them? Are they all the same? Are they all directly comparable? Can they all be simplified tools to help producers make decisions and profit? Do they require answering some simple answers or some simple questions? Answering some simple answers, that's dumb. This goes right back to your point. To help use them effectively, can they be effective in helping producers avoid serious pitfalls in their genetic programs? Go through them real quick. First of all, they are not all the same. As a matter of fact, between breeds and sources, they're extremely hard to look at the differences. Some of them, like dollars profit, I don't know whether they have like a million dollars profit and five million dollars profit, silly numbers. But you need to know what they mean. How many dollars per animal and then compare them to other animals that are, that are uh, evaluated the same way. This one's important. And this is what's the, the real answer here is you... In order to use those indexes, which we use every single day, you need to be able to answer about two questions. One, do I keep heifers or, or do I not keep heifers? If I don't keep replacement heifers, I use different indexes than if I do keep re replacement heifers. But they are awesome for keeping you in between the guardrails and headed down the right direction because, um, I mentioned this before, they help you reduce costs. Most of the other things we do to uh, selected bulls are not cost-related. When we say, hey, I'm going to buy the highest weaning weight bull there, which is fine. It's good. He's a high-growth bull maybe if his EPDs are good. It tells me nothing about what it's going to cost to keep his daughters and granddaughters and how much it costs to make a weaning weight calf that's 800 pounds. It doesn't tell me anything. But the index tells me not only how much money is going to come in, but how much money is it going to cost to use these genetics. If we're going to be, if we're going to have a genetic quality assurance for the future, it's going to involve DNA, right? It just is. And for a while, we fought it for a while, argued about it for a while, but at the end of the future, this is this is going to be a big part of our future. So DNA technology has advanced at mind-blowing pace in the last ten years. Absolutely, DNA is far more advanced in human genetics in med and medicine. Than in livestock. Is that good? Yeah. They're paying for our R&D. <laughs> because if we had to pay for the R&D that the human meta, we would, our DNA advancement would be this, this fast. All the new sequencing stuff all comes from human medicine. We, we, can't, we can't put that in as overhead in the livestock business. So that's a good thing. DNA is now employed by every single serious seed stock supplier in this nation and soon in the world. So it used to be this herd uses DNA technology, that one doesn't, this one doesn't, not anymore. If they're serious, they're all in. Simital just invested several hundreds of thousands of dollars in getting 50,000-ish cows DNA tested and, and into the database because it's that important. EBDs are included or excuse me, DNA is included in EPDs so that we can use it. It's a great thing. So that we can use, anybody remember the original DNA test, Gene Star? Oh, he's a two-star, he's a Gene Star marbling bull. One gene, one star, which meant nothing. 
But now we incorporate 50,000 sources of information into our APDs to help us make smart decisions and keep us from making, more importantly, keep us from making dumb decisions. This one down here is something that Chip made me add here just a second ago. DNA technology is a good replacement for taking weights and measurements. I've got DNA now. I don't have to take another birth weight. This is a seed stock guy question and not necessarily a, a commercial herd question. Wrong. DNA technology, this, one of the coolest things about it is that I, I take my phenotypes and I turn my phenotypes in like I always have, birth weights, weaning weights, yellow weights, marbling scores, and I turn my DNA in and it runs. They run the SNPs, they run the genes, they run the phenotypes. And the computer learns every single time. Every time that a genotype and a phenotype gets turned in together, the computer knows more than it did before about what those genotypes mean. So by the time that Simitol has 50,000 new genotypes with phenotypes, the computer starts getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And so the output is better and better and better. We, don't, we just don't have tools like that very often, that the more we do, the better it gets. I just saw an article in the Wall Street Journal I'm wandering off a little bit. The real tall basketball player from Brigham Young. What was his name? Seven foot six, play, seven foot seven, played the NBA. Anybody remember his name? Sean Bradley. Sean Bradley was his name. Sitting next to a genomicist on an airplane. First class, because he, he said he barely fit in first class. That legs kind of squalled everywhere. Sitting next to a human genomicist, he says, would you mind if we genotyped you? Sean says, Psh, great, awesome. Well, see, see why you're so tall. And because Sean had always been under the impression that he might be a genetic mutation. And that, I mean, that could, that could be an issue. But that was, you know, people told him that since he was a little kid. Well, you're like a genetic mutation. In fact, the, the, it says in the article there, there are about 20,000 genes in humans that they've discovered, which this is coming in our future, 20,000 genes that affect height. He has like 19,500 of those genes with the switch on the tall side. Almost all of this, the probability is the, is the same probability as picking one star out of our galaxy. I'm, I'm sorry, one star in our universe. Of getting all of those switches switched that way. Tall, 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 gene. Tall, 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 tall. No small ones. That's where we're, that's where we're headed in this thing. And it, you collect genotypes, you collect the phenotypes, and you evaluate them, and you get smarter and better. Here's a Trinity Farms one. Using composite bulls, Simangus bulls, is A, an effective way to make crossbreeding simple at the commercial level. B, creates unwanted variation because they're mongrels and they're not pure. C, can promote increased lifetime cow service numbers per bull, cow service per bull, over purebred bulls. D, steals heterosis away from commercial producers. Is A right? You good with A? Okay. It's a wonderful way to preserve heterosis. Those of you that live through rotational crossbreeding systems of my childhood, some of you's infanthood, some of you don't even remember, Rocky, Rotational crossbreeding systems where we turned Hereford bulls in and we turned Semitol bulls in and we turned Angus bulls in and we came back with Hereford bulls and pretty soon the Hereford bulls were breeding cows sired by the Hereford bulls and we couldn't keep track of them so pretty soon we just dumped them all together. We just bought black bulls because they were all black and polled because our systems didn't work. We wanted heterosis. Heterosis worked like crazy, but we couldn't manage it because we couldn't manage the multiple breeds and who sired what cows and kept track of we were selling calves that were... 80% British and 80% continental. We didn't have uniformity. Composites allowed us to take advantage of heterosis and promote uniformity and use the best breeds all at once. It's good stuff. This was taught far too often in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, even at our most important agriculture institutions that there was something magical about purebreds when there really wasn't. 
I'm still talking to Ted Larson. It, it, this is not true. This is not true. Lines and lines selected for certain things become more purebred, more homozygous for certain things. That was okay. Nothing wrong with that. But it also wasn't a panacea because crossbred animals wipe purebred animals out for uniformity. They said they're mongrels. They're not uniform. They're not pure. In fact, if you want to see some uniform cattle, go look at a set of composite cattle. If you want to see some non-uniform cattle, go to a big purebred breeder that's got all purebred in one breed. And there's big ones and little ones and skinny ones and fat ones. they got everything in the world. Crossbreeding improves uniformity. Crossbred bulls do breed a few more cows than purebred bulls do. They can breed three to five more cows the first year and probably last an extra year. It's a good thing. And the last one, it says, I hear this from people. Well, you know, they bought those crossbred bulls, and the purebred breeder got all the heterosis. Cro commercial herd, he didn't get a hit. He got it stolen from him. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because if I bought, if I had Hereford cows, and I bought an Angus bull, he said, well, you're getting 100% of the heterosis. You're getting 100% of the individual heterosis in that calf, and the bad news is you still got all purebred cows. So you're not taking advantage of the, by far the most important bit of heterosis. That's why it's hard to use purebred bulls in a crossbreeding program, and that's why this statement isn't right. We're giving you a chance to promote heterosis generation after generation after generation by having crossbred cows and using composite bulls on them to keep them that way. How many of you have talked about feet lately? Number one breeder conversation at the Denver Stock Show is about feet. Feet are crucial. Feet are crucial. So I had to have a foot question. Feet, foot quality is completely a genetic issue. Matter of fact, we got folks running around the country looking at a foot of every Angus bull in the country trying to come up with an answer to that. B, second option is feet is totally a function of proper bull development. Well, they fed the bulls too hard, blew the feet off of them. C, Foot quality affects longevity and profitability. We're good with that. That's a good one. D, foot quality can permanently be fixed by a good hoof, hoof trimming before the bull sale. Incidentally, there are two or three of the largest bull sellers in the United States that trim the foot, feet of every bull they sell. Now, if you, don't know, if you don't know anything about foot trimming, you just walk in there and say, those feet look good. Every one of them. And just like this fingernail here that I slammed in the door at the State of a Fake Convention, my senior year of high school, and smashed my finger. I'm not going to say, I'm just we're chasing each other around. You know, that doesn't happen anymore, but it did back then. Never grew back right. And those feet that you trim, you're going to trim again. And worse yet, you'll trim their daughters and maybe their daughters. So that's not a good answer either. Top two of the issue, yes, there's a genetic predisposition for poor feet. Shallow heels, uneven toes. Hoof doesn't wear off like it should. So it's a genetic issue. All, all breeds and all seed stock suppliers are working on that issue. However, extra energy, rumen episodes, all those kind of things contribute to foot growth and cuticle growth. So when you smell acidosis at the bull development yard, when you see a white line, that's too big at the top of the, top of the foot. When you see bulls, when you walk out in the bullpen in the morning and they won't get up, and they tell you they're just real docile. They're not real docile. They're in pain. It hurts. And they limp. Those things are signs of the bulls, that the diet of the bulls, it's not always energy. Sometimes energy, sometimes energy, that the rumen of that bull is not, is not been developed correctly. And because of that, it's permeable. You're getting things in the bloodstream you don't need, and, and the body's trying to get rid of it by sending it out in the hoof and sending it out in the hair. Here's a nice one. Like I said, you guys are getting the, you're the guinea pigs for this. and Obviously, it's not a very hard test, but it does give me a chance to talk about things. What's the ideal frame size of a bull? You guys frame size them? Pull it. I can't remember. Yep, got frame size. What's the ideal frame size? Three? Five, Paulette's in at five, six, seven, nine. 
We saw some nine-frame cows this week, I'm not going to lie. Didn't think there still were any left. We saw some. <laughs> or D, the bigger the better. Or the smaller the better. In Kit Farrell world, smaller the better. I like five. I'm good with that. I'm good with six. I'm good with four. It's more important that you know what frame size translates to. You understand the variability in its measurement. And ultimately, how they will change over their life. That's why people like fours, fives, and sixes. Because if they get a little smaller or a little bigger, it doesn't ruin their whole day. Frame size was based on slaughter weight. Start off with Dr. John Massey and folks like that in Missouri. And they predicted this frame size animal would finish at this weight. And that his sisters would end up being 1 to 200 pounds heavier than he was when he was harvesting. You know that? So it started off being weight. So I'd argue with you that having been in a lot of situations like this, seven frame steers, 15, 16, 17, 100 pound harvest weights. Five frame steers, 13 and a half to 16 and a half. Five frame cows, if they're like you like them to be, are 1,400 pound cows. Seven frame cows, or 1,700 pound cows. So know what frame size translates to and understand that when they measure them, if they're off an inch, they're off by half a frame size. And if, the, and if that bull's doing this and they're holding a stick or they're shooting down, it is not easy to miss them by a whole frame size when you measure them. In my opinion, there's three frame sizes. I did not put that on this test because it is my opinion and not a fact. There is too big for my environment, too small for my environment, and just right. In your case, it was a six, right? You said six back there. You said five. Just right for your environment. I'm getting close to the end. What is stay EPD? A, it's a genetic prediction for improving cow longevity. I think that might come right out of the ASA EPD description. B is backed by millions of lifetime cow records, not in single herds, but in thousands of herds. C is a substantial part of the dollars API selection index that IGS employs and promotes. Or D, it's one of the most crucial and underused EPDs of all of them presented by all breeds anywhere ever, ever. Down here somewhere is E. That would be all of the above. Stability is a great is a great tool because you can spend your entire life trying to improve cow productivity and fertility as a commercial producer. And besides management, if you don't do an awesome job of, of choosing your seed stock source, then it's not going to change. They're going to be, I crossbreed them so they do a little bit better, but they're going to be 5 to 8% dry. Cows are going to last a similar number of years. I'm going to have to keep 15 more efforts than I thought I would because I can't get them bred or I can't get them bred. Stay helps you get to those issues. And this is the biggest deal. Because it's so lowly heritable, you need millions of records to improve females and not hundreds of records like at your house. It takes millions of records to show which ones last and which ones don't. And number one driver of profitability for cow-calf. Number one profitability is how long the cow stays in the herd, how early she calves in the breeding season, and, and that you don't have to replace her. You know, if you if you have a 500 cow herd, and you can add an extra year through heteros or through heterosis, or an extra year and a half or two years by selection for this, means you might calve somewhere between 500 and a thousand less heifers in your lifetime, and have to deal with and have to and that 500 to a thousand less unproductive years of those open he virgin heifers becoming two-year-olds, the year that she doesn't do anything but just hang around. That's why it's so valuable. So we're right up, right up against the bottom. Which of the following would you say is a true statement? A, cost. this was actually part of my presentation that I was going to give. Cost of production will likely increase in the future. How many of you know on that one? Not going down. I don't see it going down. I wish it, if it goes down, bad things are happening. We're all in a lot of trouble if it goes down. That's kind of sad to say it that way, but probably how it is. 
B, industry participants will likely know more about the cattle, my cattle, that they utilize in the future than they do today. Everybody on the panel said yes. They're going to know more. Data is easier to get. There's more of it. Traceability, going to know more. C, the world market for beef will likely be more competitive in the future. I can't see it being less competitive. Everything gets more competitive that way. D, the more tools, data, and technology, more, excuse me, more tools, data, and technology will likely affect my business more in the future than it does today. Some of us don't like that. <laughs> Some days I don't like that. Some days I just like to go back in time. They don't let us go back in time. <laughs> your cell phone will not let you go back in time. It will drive you forward every day of your life, whether you like it or not. All of the above is true, and the decisions that these guys are making genetically and that you guys have to make need to be based on these assumptions because they're true. They're true and logical and smart assumptions, and if your genetic decisions are going to last 15 years, you better make some long-term good assumptions, like that fuel's not going to go down, cost of landing going to go down, those good things. So last, I think this is the last one. You should consider changing seed stock supplier if, A, they do an unprofessional job of bull development. Would you change your seed stock provider if they did a lousy job of developing bulls? Sure you would. It's one of the biggest services they provide. B, if they discourage the use of EPDs. They don't believe those EPDs. Believe me. I know what's right. That all other stuff. That isn't right. You, you need to run because they got something in store for you, <laughs> but it might be worse. What if they don't stand behind the bulls and females they sell? Yeah, you're not sticking around. Oh, I'm shocked. We, I know several seed stock producers that don't warrant either bulls at all. And people still go there and buy bulls. Now, they won't for long. And they switch, they switch uh, customers every two years. But you, you don't buy anything. What, what can you buy today that doesn't come with a warranty? You can take anything. You can take your cheeseburger back after you ate half of it. You can take anything back. If they discourage crossbreeding, then they're more interested in their success than your success. And you need to go somewhere else. And ultimately, if they don't have a long-term plan for helping you stay in business, since the decisions they're making genetically today, as I said, are five, six years in the future for the bulls you buy, and 15 years past that, for the daughters of the bull, you buy five and six years from now. If they don't have a long-term plan for the future, go find someone that does. Because all those things, again, all of the above, they're simple questions. But they're questions we need to get to, we need to get some answers to. I got a couple more slides. It's not important anymore because I think we've gotten to what we want to. This book, I wanted to talk about source. I wanted to talk about the future. And I also wanted to talk about some kind of smaller issues that, that affect the way we buy bulls and affect uh, the way we choose seed stock producers and, and some of the truisms in our business that, uh, that affect our bottom line every day. So anyway, I'm done. If you've got questions, you don't have to take them now. If you've got one, that'd be great. Otherwise, I know you guys are looking to get home, and we're going to go to Spokane, and Rocky's going to make it maybe all the way to Missoula or Helena yet tonight. So appreciate you, those of you that stuck around. Appreciate you sticking around for this and uh, for coming today. Thanks to the foreman's. And uh, give, let's give the foremans a nice hand for their hospitality.